Hello, everybody. <laughs> Good morning. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about SemanticDB for Scala developer tools. Um, and this is a project I've been working on for uh, over a year and a half now. So, uh, but it's the first talk I ever do on SemanticDB par in particular. So it's sort of behind, been behind the scenes. So I'm really excited to, to share you uh, what I have. So let me see if this. Briefly about myself, um, I'm the author of Scala FMT. Um, and Scalafix, I work on tooling at the Scala Center, and I'm also a maintainer of Scala Meta. So, uh, uh, are you familiar with the, uh, the Scala Center? Any? Very cool. So, uh, it's an organization that's at EPFL. We're funded by an advisory board of uh, several companies, and uh, we work on open source, and we work on, on MOOCs online on Coursera. And uh, I sort of added a new bullet to the website with tooling, because uh, quite a few of us are primarily working just on tooling as well. So, uh, um, are you familiar with Meta? Okay, quite many. I'm impressed. Okay, well, it's, okay. And uh, it's an open source project uh, that was uh, founded by uh, Eugene Bermako, and um, it's existed for over three, four years now. And um, well, we have quite a few. Uh, contributors and, and we have full-time developers funded by both by the Scala Center and for Twitter. So it's a, an active project with quite a lot of collaboration going on. Um, and as of the numbers this month, we're getting around 120,000 downloads on the core module that we have, uh, which has been growing quite a lot for the last year. So that's exciting. Um, and um, so I, I, I got, got into tooling because uh, I wanted to do a code formatter. Um, I'd been working with Python where I had a formatter, and then I, I went into Scala, and I, was, I felt sort of handicapped. So that's how I got started. Um, and uh, then I was hired to work on uh, Scalafix, which is uh, sort of a similar tool. It takes Scala code, prints out Scala code, pretty much the same as formatting, except it needs to know a lot more about the code. It needs to know the types. It needs to know symbols uh, so that it can insert, for example, explicit result types. Um, and the fact that it's a short name means that you need to know what's in scope, uh, that it doesn't conflict with another symbol. Maybe you need to add an import. So it's, it's on the surface, maybe looks exactly like Scala FMT, but behind the scenes is actually a completely different pipeline uh, of information that you need to, to drive those refactorings. So this is sort of the story into Semantic DB is that we, we needed this tool. Uh, it was supposed to run in batch mode for, for uh, to help migrate between uh, compiler versions. Uh, and um, uh, so I have a quote, but it's. So uh, we have Shane actually in the room, so uh, <laughs> this is his quote. But uh, they've managed to use Scalafix to perform a large scale uh, refactoring at the, of the Scala code base at Twitter. So they have one of the largest Scala code bases in the world. So I think that's pretty. Exciting to see that for such a large project, they're able to run semantic rewriting um, at scale. And this has never, ever been done possible before. Um, and you wonder, why is it possible to do such large scale refactoring? And I say it, it's because of semantic DB uh, and the way it's designed. So that's at the end of the talk. I hope that you'll know a bit more what semantic DB is and why it's enabling these applications. So. Um, Scalafix enabled us to run refactorings in a distributed fashion, which is necessary for a code base the size of ours. Um, and that's pretty exciting. So the agenda today, I'm going to say, is sort of the traditional model of how you would do tools in Scala. Uh, would you would write a compiler plugin. Uh, and if you're another alternative that many people do as well is maybe just look at class files. Um, so that's sort of the same, but I'll, I say compiler plugin right now. Um, and I'm sort of going to compare it to how the new way of doing it with semantic DB is, uh, and hopefully convince all of the tooling developers in here to 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 join us on this uh, new architecture. Uh, I'm going to explain what the schema is, so the semantic DB schema, show you the, the the utilities that we have to produce the data, to consume the data, um, analyze it, and and then at the end I'm going to have three demos. So if you're not an advanced tooling expert uh, in this room right now, uh, you may sort of maybe doze out a bit in the, the, the utilities part because it's sort of fairly advanced. But I'm a, I know quite a few people in the audience here are very deep into 
this domain, so it may be a bit more catered to the more advanced people in the utilities part. But uh, don't fall asleep, because the demos will be cool and, and hopefully interesting for everybody. Um, so traditionally, you would write a compiler plugin. And this is the first version of how Scalafix looked like in 2016. And I had a compiler plugin that was called Scalafix. Uh, and the build tool, such as SPT, would then add a compiler flag to say, enable this plugin. And then in one of the compiler phases, uh, Scala C would invoke Scala, uh, Scala Fix, uh, give access to the compiler trees with the types and everything, and then Scala Fix would just perform the refactorings there on the spot, which is a bit crazy because it's writing the sources that, that are being compiled. Um, and um, the, uh, the difference now with SemanticDB is that we have a compiler plugin that we call SemanticDB, and it does not perform any sort of action except persist uh, SemanticDB files. Uh, and these files are, you could treat them as if they were JSON files. It's the same thing. It's just raw data of strings and ints, et cetera, lists, objects. And then as a, the tool, Scalafix, can run any time later uh, on purely the data instead of doing it during compilation. And what's really nice is that you have better control of where you run, and you can have multiple, multiple tools consuming the same data for, multiple, for different sort of applications. So what's the problem with compiler plugins? Well, <clears throat> first of all, you're sort of thrown into Scala compiler. Uh, and they, the, a large chunk of the APIs are undocumented. And, and I don't mean that as in there are missing Scala docs. I mean as in if you have a case class, what are the uh, modifiers for the fields? Uh, if you have, what are the generated methods? Um, if for a Java class, is there? As one symbol, or are there two? So the Scala compiler produces two symbols for Java class, grouping the static methods and the non-static methods. And these things are maybe somewhat undocumented, and you sort of just implement everything against internals of the compiler. And, and these are not supported, as in you are subject to breaking changes on every upgrade, uh, which is not great if you want to do something that cross builds for 2.11, 2.12, 2.13, etc. cetera. Um, but the other thing is often the data that you want is not always available at a single snapshot in the compiler. It's actually available in multiple different phases. So if your tool needs to work on a particular subset of, of, of an analysis, you may need to hook into different phases. And you need to be able to communicate somehow when you're getting called back from the compiler. So this is sort of a fragile dance uh, to, to play. Um, and then the other thing is that you're essentially limited to a compilation run of what the compiler does. So if you have a build, multi-module build, which is the norm today, you have main and test sources. You can only run the analysis within one, each of those independently. Uh, and depending on what you're doing, this may be, well, if you're doing dead code elimination, that doesn't work, right? Because uh, you need to know sort of a more global view of the project. And then finally, from my anecdotal, anecdotal experience, uh, they're actually very difficult to test and maintain uh, these plugins. So in comes the savior, SemanticDB. <laughs> Uh, in a nutshell, SemanticDB is a 300-line protobuf schema. And whenever you hear me say protobuf, you can replace it in your head with JSON. It's the same. We chose protobuf because, one, it has a nice way to write a schema that's typed. And two, it's more compact uh, to both faster to write and faster to read. But in essence, you can do two JSON on all of these data structures because uh, they map one to one. Um, and then to accompany this very small schema, we actually have a very large specification that thoroughly documents every single piece of functionality, how a language construct maps into this schema. And we have a section for Java and for Scala. We'll talk a bit about it more later. And then we have sort of a suite of utilities to both produce the data, depending on what inputs you have. Uh, and then we have uh, applications that we're building with the data, which is sort of the, the, the main objective here. Um, so I'll be going through each of these, and I'll be showing you what the tools do. So I'm hoping at the end of this talk, you will be able to know the difference between meta CP, meta C, meta P, M tags. Um, they're all related, but slightly different. So um, the schema. The, the cornerstone data structure that we have there are, <coughs> is a text document. And this is a single object. Uh, you can see the, um, these are sort of the keys of that data. Uh, and this is the values. So 
the, for a single document, you contain the relative URI of that, relative to the source root of the project. Uh, you know the version of the SemanticDB schema. It contains the full text contents of the, the, the file, uh, what programming language it's written in, the uh, occurrences. So these are I'm going to expand on symbol occurrences and symbol information. But they essentially say which positions in the file uh, symbols appear. Uh, and then the information is, these are the signatures that are defined in this file. Uh, and I will not go into diagnostics or synthetics, but uh, they're also in there, and they're used for quite a lot of cool things. So symbol occurrence is a fact about an appearance of a single symbol uh, at a given location. So in essence, the, uh, we, this, I will be, this will be a running example, Spire Math Complex because I just like the code Inspire is a really nice library. Um, so it's a case class, and it's defined in line number four, column 18, until line four, column 25. And then we have a role for each symbol occurrence, which says whether it's a definition or a reference. And um, uh, we'll, on the roadmap to add more roles so that this is sort of an extends position or it's an import, etc. cetera. Um, so just to take one more example, um, here we are referencing a symbol called real, well, and then it's not a definition, it's a reference. Um, and here you can see there's uh, a symbol referencing real here. So I'd like to stress, I haven't really said it explicitly, but symbols in SemanticDB are nothing but string IDs. They're something you could put into a database and query by, or you could have a hash map and you can put it into the keys. But beyond that, they have no other significant meaning. You do not have to extract any information from the symbol syntax. They're nothing more than IDs, but they just happen to be very readable, so you sort of know what they're referencing. That's nice. Um, so then on to the next one, which is symbol information. So this is a signature explaining, like this is uh, all of the metadata about a particular definition. So for a symbol information for the same case class here, uh, it has a particular kind, which is one of. So it can only be either a class, a method, parameter, type parameter. Uh, it cannot be both class and type parameter. That wouldn't make sense. Um, it's defined in a particular language. It has a particular name, uh, and it has an owner. So this is sort of repeating what I said before. You do not have to extract anything out of the syntax because the simple information contains how to find the enclosing package or how to extract the name of something. Um, it contains types, and uh, it contains both types that you're familiar with, such as map from int to string or list of well, et cetera. But you also have types for things like classes or types for things like methods, uh, which you cannot write in code. But the type of a class will be the list of its extends and then the, uh, the, the list of symbols that it contains in the members. So um, that's documented in the symbol information right there. Uh, properties are sort of complementary to the kind, but you can have many of properties. So you could have implicit, case, class, final, etc. Um, and then you have the list of annotations, uh, and then the accessibility. So if it's private or public, protected, that's documented in the symbol information. So to give another example here, you have a parameter. Uh, it also has the name, and you can see that it's has this, this, the symbol of the method here, and then the, the R for the parameter. Uh, but it has an owner, and then the type semmering too, an implicit modifier. So I'd say those are the three main data structures that are relevant in SemanticDB. Um, I did not go into type. We have a fairly, the, the sort of half of the, the data, the schema is essentially Ex listing out all of the cases of the Scala type system. Uh, but the really interesting piece is these are just raw data. Uh, it's very easy to produce bogus data, or if you're writing code you don't, or using SemanticDB for your tools, it's sort of difficult to know how does this look like in Scala. If I want to target a Java class with a static method, or I want to find a case class with a field like this, well, we have a spec that is 11,000 words and comprehensively covers all language features, or most language features in Scala, and also for Java, uh, for signatures. And um, uh, you, it's sort of a reference point. This is not great documentation if you just want to get started. But if you already have started and you need a reference point to look up information, 
you can go to the spec. So just, I'm gonna quickly open up here just so you can have a... So here you can see the specification, um, and it's a fairly comprehensive document uh, with quite a lot of examples. So you can see class definitions, and then they link to the, the Java language spec, saying this is the place where it's relevant for Scala, and we do the same for Java. And then you can say, well, here is a class, it has a val, it is a var, and then we list out, this is how the symbols would look like, these are their kinds, these are their types, and these are just examples to give you an idea of how the, the data should look like. So I've, we started doing this, and we've been working on this for the past three months, uh, or four months, and, and Eugene Bermako started writing this, and I was sort of skeptical in the beginning, like, wow, that's a lot of work to write this large document. But at, now I find it sort of, I can't live without it, because it's the place that where we say, this is a reproduction, this behavior is not compliant with the spec, and I, I felt like we're moving way, way faster now, uh, thanks to this. So just to give you an example, uh, this is an example about Scala parameters. It's a very niche, small piece of the, the language, and it turns out that the Scala language spec doesn't even explain parameters. There's no section about parameters, but we have a section. And, and you can say, well, here uh, are these things, they're by name, are they repeated? Are they context bounds, view bounds? They will look like this. They will have these symbols, uh, and they will have these types. So th this is really neat. Uh, and then the, um, the Java class, if you're just curious, how does a Java class look like in SemanticDB? Well, you can look up there, and you can see an example, uh, including how to do um, statics, overloading, etc. So that was the schema part. Uh, and now I'm going to go on a section where I'll be saying the words meta C, meta CP, meta P, and M tags quite a lot. Uh, and I hope you're not going to be com too confused. Uh, and I hope you can maybe understand why these tools are really awesome um, at the end of this explanation. So the first one is meta C. Uh, and this is essentially the compiler plugin. It says, we're able to produce semantic DB files with a live compiler instance, the Scala compiler. Uh, and this one is able to produce the full breadth of the spec, signatures and uh, occurrences. So to give an example, essentially, if, if so uh, to, to invoke a compiler plugin, you say X plugin, da da, and, and if you actually don't even care about the class files, you can just tell it to stop after the semantic DB phase. Uh, and what it'll do is produce in the target directory where you would normally put the class files, uh, it'll produce a meta inf directory, a semantic DB directory, and then it'll create a, a clone or mapping, remapping, of the source tree before, but with semantic DB files. Um, and so in SPT, you would just say add compiler plugin. Um, but I added the command line example here because there are a lot of uh, more build tools than SPT, as we know. <laughs> uh, and this is essentially the interface for Meta C. Um, and for sort of convenience, when you're trying out locally, if you just want to write a small file and see how it looks like, well, you can also uh, use one of our uh, utilities, which we call, is called Meta C, which just does the work of, of setting up the compiler plugin and this thing here. So you can just run locally Meta C this, and you can get produce the, the semantic DB files. And sort of to explain what's inside of the contents here of the, this semantic DB file, that'll be a list of text documents. So uh, that will be the contents of, of, um, of these files if you parse them. Uh, so Meta CP is, uh, unlike Meta C, uh, does not have a live compiler. It's if you only have class files. So you could be depending on the JDK, you could be depending on CATS. CATS is not compiled with Meta C, uh, but you still need to understand the signatures that are in the CATS jars. So Meta CP can build semantic DBs, signatures only, from the class path. Um, so we both have a library API where you can just invoke it with, you can provide a class path and some, a couple of settings. And um, uh, you can also use one of our command line tools. Where you just pass it a jar. So Meta CP by convention will, um, will take the jar, process it, and write the output into a, a cache directory for the user machine, um, and then return you that. So if you call it again, it'll just immediately return you back. Uh, with that uh, output jar. The difference between the input jar and the output jar is that the input jar contains class files. This jar contains only um, 
semantic DB files, so no class files. Um, and uh, the reason we have this is, uh, well, quite a lot of tools like Coursier, they already cache stuff. That it's what makes things fast, right? If you, you don't want to download the same jar again and again and again. So this is how MetaCP works. And um, just to give you an example of what the contents of this jar file would be if you'd poke into it, it'll essentially be a lot of symbol informations. But there will not be any symbol occurrences because we don't have code. We only have class files. So there you would get the uh, signature of, of complex, the parameters, the methods, etc. cetera. Um, so mtags is sort of the, the, the brother or sibling to uh, MetaCP. It's, it's the reverse. We don't have class files. We don't have a compiler, but we have only source files. Um, and uh, so this, what you have, what you, what you can do with source files, you don't even have a class path, so you can't compile it, you can't type check it. But we can uh, index it for the locations of the definitions for all of the symbols. Uh, so m tags is if you have a parser, you can just run it on a bunch of source code, and it'll spit out semantic DB files saying these are the locations for the definition of all of these symbols, and very soon it'll also include the doc strings uh, for each of the symbols. So if, let's say if you're doing something like Hoover, uh, you can include the doc string. And uh, this works, mtags works, has a module both for Java and for Scala, so it can index both Scala source files and Java source files. Um, and similarly to MetaCP, this is, uh, is, it has a library API, and I sort of cheated by including a, a command line example, because it actually doesn't exist. But when I was writing the slides, I was thinking, why the hell doesn't um, tags have a command line interface? So uh, it will be working like this in the near future. So I sort of cheated. <laughs> uh, but it works exactly the same, except you pass it a jar that contains the sources. So typically, a library is published to Maven, it'll have a sources jar uh, containing only text files for Scala and for Java. So uh, tags essentially spins through that and looks at the uh, locations of the uh, definitions and registers them. Uh, so the, um, the, the Java indexer is fairly fast. I think it can index around, on my machine, around half a million lines of code per second. Uh, so this is something when you, let's say if you, for example, import a project in the IDE, you, um, uh, you index this so you can go to definition, you can to go into another file. So. Um, uh, and then meta p is not to produce, but to consume, to, to sort of analyze and to debug and see what these files are. Uh, so it's just to pretty print these semantic DB files locally, which is very handy for, for testing. We use it significantly for testing. So uh, we use meta p as the spec for how to pretty print things. And then we save these to text files, and then we change code, and then we actually assert that things have not changed, so we prevent regressions. Uh, but MetaP has a command line interface, and you can just pass it a file. Uh, and what it'll do is print out primarily two sections. It's a bit bigger, the output, but it'll say one section is for symbols, and it's sort of a key value map from symbols to their uh, informations. And if you can remember, the, um, the signatures that you see here, those can be produced by MetaCP. So then you also have the occurrences section, which you can see there the line number, column, which is the start position, and the line number column, the end position. Uh, there is a reference to a particular symbol at that location. Um, and as you remember, m tags can only do the definition. So you can see that the arrows are pointing to the left. That indicates a definition, whereas if the arrows are pointing to the right, it means a reference. Um, and to combine it, MetaC pr produces the full breadth of this. So. Uh, I hope you now understand what the difference is between meta C, meta CP, meta P. If you open up our issue tracker, we have this all over the place. We will label the issues, etc. So I think some people are a bit confused if they don't know what these mean. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to show you the demo. So if, if, if you don't know what I was talking about, it's fine, because now there's just going to be fun demos. So um, I'm going to talk about three projects, uh, Metadoc, Metals, and Scalafix. Um, I personally put Metadoc in the front because I think it's the least known project, but it's also, in my opinion, one of the coolest uh, applications of SemanticDB. And um, so Metadoc is a static site generator. You just say you can compile your project with MetaC. You pass the class path to, the, to MetaC, 
it spits out an, an index.html and pure static site that you could just serve on GitHub pages. Uh, but it's you can navigate the source code with go to definition, find references. So there are a bunch of cloud services that sort of do this for your company, et cetera. But what's really sort of unique with Metadoc, it's a pure static site. It has no, does not require any backend uh, um, server. So uh, uh, I'm just going to show you how it looks like. So here we're going to scalometa.org slash metadoc, and this is the, uh, the example we have on our website. Um, the, this is a pure static site. It spins up an instance of the Monaco editor, which is the same editor that VS Code uses. So it's exactly the same interface. You can, you can go to here, find all references. And this is driven purely by whatever the static site is. So here you can go, and I can switch to another file. And uh, if I want to share with my friends something like, hey, you should check out this unit test here, uh, you can just send a link to them. And the link that when they open it is the exact selection that you sent to your colleague. I think that's pretty unique. It's more advanced than what you can do on GitHub because you can link. You can just select like, oh, this is the piece that you're interested in. Um, and uh, what we can also do is go to definition. And you can also look up for the symbols. So if it says something like line, you can browse the symbols here. Uh, the reason I haven't sort of made much noise about this project is because we still are not able to sort of open up the file name by it. So uh, if anyone wants to help contribute that, then I think that would push it to a proper release. Um, and then I'd love to also be able to, because we have all of that data available, I'd love to be able to do some a, a similar user interface like this thing here, but I'd like to be able to open up symbols in another file. So we have all of the data. It's essentially I just don't know how to use it in the Monaco editor. So I, I would really appreciate some help there too. Um, so this is Metadoc, uh, and there is an SPT plugin. So essentially, you can just say add SPT plugin Metadoc and run Metadoc in SPT, and it'll spit out a website that list. So if you have a company, you could run this after every CI merge. And uh, I have produced a static site for a corpus of over 2 million lines of code. Uh, and it's I've sort of optimized the pipeline because it took five seconds for that corpus to build all of the in-memory, find all references, indices for every single symbol. And then it took 15 seconds to write all of the data to a zip file. <laughs> so it's totally bottlenecked by essentially I.O. Uh, but computing all of the references for all of the, and, and all of the positions for all of the symbols is essentially like this. And the output for that large corpus was 200 megabytes. So it's, it's something that you could just do even if you have a, a sizable corpus. Uh, you could generate this site essentially on every CI and, and, and host it with whatever flavor of, of files servers that you have, uh, which I think is cool. The, uh, so then Metals is a project that uh, Gabriele and me and, and then Alexei is also in the room and Shane has been working on it uh, and uh, some other people. Uh, we started in November, essentially Gabriele, uh, he wanted to get Scala fix into the editor. That was sort of like, hey, I really want to get linting into the editor. It's like, cool, let's do it. Um, and we had that working, and they're like, but we have semantic DB set up now. We can go so far. So uh, this was in November, and then like we started adding go to definition, find references, rename. <laughs> um, so Metals is, um, is an expert. It's not even published on the marketplace. Uh, if you want to give it a try, it's essentially not ready at all for any sort of day-to-day -day coding. Uh, it's primarily been used as an experimental ground to be doing more stuff with uh, uh, ScalaFix, uh, Scala, um, SemanticDB, etc. So um, the uh, what's neat is that I'm, I'm using VS Code here, but it's a language server, so it also works with Atom, and it has support for. Uh, there's a plugin for Atom too, and um, the the main sort of features are. Well, as you can see here, you have a nice outline to browse code. And um, here we have the complex class. Uh, and we can find all references. And it's very fast uh, once it's uh, built the indices. And uh, you can browse between files. You can go to definition. And uh, so this is purely based with Meta C because we've compiled the project with Meta C. Everything works really well inside of the project. But then we use uh, M tags to index the, the library dependencies. So here we're looking at the standard library array tabulate. And so if I'm hoovering, we show the signature. And this is produced purely with semantic DB. Uh, so you know the signatures from the, 
from meta C P. So what's really neat is that we can go to definition here, um, and that'll jump to the, um, uh, the the tabulate in the standard library. So uh, you may have noticed that that was, uh, or maybe you didn't notice, but it jumped to the wrong method overload, uh, and that was a bug that was fixed on the spree on Sunday. But we just I just don't have that version locally right now. But I thought what was really cool is that that was a fairly advanced thing to be able to jump to a correct method overload in the, the dependencies with M tags. And that was contributed by someone who had not worked at the code base at all before. Uh, and in a day, that was working. Uh, and it handles structural types with types, singleton types, uh, uh, the whole spec of the language. Because essentially, we just followed the document and covered all of the cases. Um, so it doesn't only work for Scala dependencies. It also works for the Java dependencies. So here we can go into the Java IO file input output stream. Uh, and it opens up the um, uh, the output stream. So what's really neat is that uh, in, in VS Code, now we hand it over to the Java language server. So what's really cool is that you can go to definition here as well in uh, the Java files, but that's not even metals. That's just the Java language server. But we were sort of able to hand it over there. So I think that's really exciting too. Um, and then, well, we have things like rename. And um, uh, then we have a Scala fix integration as well. Uh, which I'm not going to show right now here, but we have uh, linting with Scalafix, and we also have refactorings with Scalafix. So you can say, oh, there's a, is there unused import. Um, you can go uh, remove unused imports, and it fixes it. So and and more on the way, I'd like to add add explicit result types, etc. So it's sort of a testing ground to to say, okay, we have these these nice new tools built with SemanticDB. We have Scalafix. Uh, it does also code formatting with Scala FMT, so you can just go and format. Um, uh, Hoover, find references. Uh, we have an integration with the Scala presentation compiler, but uh, I find it to be quite unstable so far. Um, uh, we also have an integration with SPT server, <laughs> so that when you save, you can actually trigger compilation in the build tool and, and, and push in diagnostics. But um, that is the demo that we sort of uh, was was to try and build a language server using SemanticDB. Uh, and we have a small team. We're essentially doing this in our free time. And I think it's impressive how far we can go. Um, and then the last bit is uh, Scalafix, which is what is actually my full-time job. So uh, the um, uh, what I was able to, what I've been working on for the past four months now, primarily as my objective was to do explicit result types so that if you have inferred members publicly, it will insert uh, and a type annotation. So this looks easy because, well, if you use IntelliJ, it's essentially just well, you take it for granted that it works. But it's actually a complicated problem because, first of all, you need the full signature. You need to cover all of the cases of the type system. And what you need to do is you don't want to insert really long name. You want to insert, you don't want to have to do roots.com.spire.math.complex. You want to insert short names. And you want to make sure that those don't conflict with whatever is in scope. And you don't want to insert any redundant imports. You don't only want to import whatever is exactly missing. So what's really exciting is that this is a diff that was produced by Scalafix uh, three weeks ago. Um, it's still not merged because I, uh, it had, still has a few rough edges. But we're able to insert explicit result types for the whole Slick code base. So are you familiar with Slick? Yeah, so I was looking for a code corpus that sort of was like stressing the full breadth of the Scala type system. Uh, and Slick is that code base if you're ever looking for a code base like that, because it has everything you can imagine. Path-dependent types, singleton types, projections, name it, structural, they're all there. Uh, so that was a really good test case. And as you can see, we're um, here we're adding dub info, which apparently was not in scope. It added an import. But here we have const array, uh, which was already in scope. Uh, and what's really cool is that I ran this on Slick, batch mode through SPT, just explicit result types. Uh, it, this it's currently quite slow, but I think it'll be uh, much faster uh, eventually. And uh, it ran it in batch mode for a very large corpus, uh, and I compiled afterwards, and the project still compiled. And I think that's really awesome, in the sense that we want really robust refactoring, something that goes from a compiling state to a compiling state. If you have a code base that has hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you can't just go one by one and do it, and then fix all of the bugs that are not just by not handling all of the cases of the language. So this is a major milestone. Uh, it's been taking a really long time to reach here. Uh, but this is enabled purely by the work that we've been doing for the past uh, months on SemanticDB. 
So uh, I'm really excited to, to sort of release this and, and, and get it into people's hands. So um, I'm running soon out of time. The um, conclusion is we have a 300 line JSON schema. Uh, it documents symbols, types, uh, occurrences in source file. Uh, we have a very comprehensive spec that documents how these things map from different languages, both for Java and for Scala. Uh, we have a suite of utilities that help you produce the data, to analyze the data, process the data. Uh, and, uh, well, we're building a family of tools uh, that are using the data for, which is the objective, is to have better tools for Scala. So if you're excited, if you think this is interesting, come and talk to me, because uh, I think that there's a lot of potential in doing more than just what I've shown you today. Um, so. Um, That'll be it for me. Thank you. Questions? Uh, hey, so uh, how does it play with Dotty? Would be much effort to accommodate, or? I'm sorry. How does it play with Dotty? Uh, would be it so the way I would imagine if it would be to so tasty is really nice because I, I think you essentially don't need to do compiler plugin. Um, tasty produces full trees, so doing something that would just produce semantic DVs from uh, tasty would I imagine is doable. I haven't taken a stab at it. Um, so for me, I see them as complementary because this is a much much simpler to produce and to 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 read uh, format. Uh, and as I've shown you with M tags, you can produce partial information even if you just have a parser. Uh, so um, I see them as totally complementary. Um, yeah. What languages can Semantic DB handle? How general is it? So uh, I am very cautious to claim language agnosticity because uh, everyone says that, but then sort of the proof is in the pudding. Um, we have, I can only say what we have. Uh, it's, we have a very comprehensive implementation for Scala, and we have the uh, symbol information implementation for Java. Um, if you add a new language with a different type system, uh, so I was considering adding protobuf to the languages supported by SemanticDB because I'm using protobuf a lot. <laughs> uh, well, we had to add new cases for the one-offs for sort of these custom protobuf features. So uh, in there, there is another project called Kaith that you may be familiar with. Have you heard of it? That they use internally at Google to produce, to do sort of language agnostic code analysis. Uh, and they also have a protobuf schema for the Kaith sort of model. Um, it doesn't really map so great maybe for Scala, um, but they do cover C++, more languages, etc. cetera. Um, so I'd say primarily we are focused on Scala and we're focusing on making advanced tools in Scala possible, such as ScalaFix. So that's the primary use case. Yeah, so this is not so much a question to you, but to the audience. Um, we'd like to use this in Enzyme. So we're probably going to do a spike of using MetaCP and uh, meta tags in Enzyme. And if anyone wants to contribute to that, that would be very, very welcome. Because then we'll have a full LSP that uses this for navigation and the presentation compiler for interactive stuff. So mm. yeah, get involved. if. If you're interested, I'm going to do that. Questions in the back? No. No? Okay, thank you very much.